Good afternoon, everyone. This is Professor Denham, and I'm going to be talking to you today about Chapter 5. Alrighty, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and I'm going to bring up my PowerPoints on Chapter 5, and that you may use these while you study and be very good for you. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead to Chapter 5. And this is the um, chapter on nursing care of women with complications during pregnancy. Okay, so I always sort out my lessons with an objectives. So we're going to explain the use of fetal diagnostic tests in women with complication in pregnancy. You know, such as I just comes to think of um, one, um, an amniocentesis. Another one could be also apophyta protein tests. So let's go ahead and identify some methods to reduce a woman's risk for antipartal complications and describe these complications, their treatment, and their nursing care. So characteristic causes of high-risk pregnancies. Well, one, it can relate to the pregnancy itself. Absolutely. We have conditions such as um, gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes. These are things that are related to the pregnancy itself. Um, then they can occur because the woman has some medical condition or injury that complicates the pregnancy. Absolutely. Now, remember, we talked about this in another chapter, but that first visit we talked about, that's so important that we get her medical condition along with her surgical, you know, complications also. And then you have um, cause of high-risk pregnancy can result from environmental hazards that affect the fetus or the mother. And then you have behaviors or lifestyles that have a negative effect on the mother. Yes, such as if she has multiple partners that would be um, open her up to more of the sexually in, sexually transmitted infections. Or she has um, behaviors such as um, smoking um, and, and the use of um, drugs that could also affect both mother and fetus during pregnancy. So what are your nursing responsibilities? Well, I'm going to prepare my patient properly. Anytime that you're going to do a test on a patient, you always want to prepare them. You want to give them information about the test, what they could expect, you know, maybe if they have to be in certain positions for the test. Um, and then you have to always explain the reason for the test. And also, you have to go over risk factors especially such as what I'm thinking of is the amniocentesis that has such risk factors involved. And we'll go over that in just a minute. But, you know, if mom, want, if she's an AMA patient, which is advanced maternal age, yes, she probably wants to get a chromosome analysis. And the best way to do that would be to um, have an amniocentesis. But again, Whenever you're going to have a, a patient's going to have a test, you want to make sure that they're well informed. Okay, all righty. So, I got some danger signs in pregnancy. Um, these come right from your book, and the reason why I put these in here is because they are some danger signs. I want you to be, I want you to get used to seeing these because as we, as you journey through the maternity, you these things will creep up. And you'll say, oh, yeah, that was a danger sign that she went over. So we're going to go over these. So one is a sudden gush of fluid from the vagina. That could be that she could be preterm. She could be maybe 26 weeks. And she also sudden has this gush of fluid. And that could be her bag of waters, um, which would not be good at that early gestational age. Now, she could have vaginal bleeding. Um, she could be uh, undiagnosed placenta previa, where she comes in and she's got this painless bleeding. Um, and what, where is it coming from? I mean, why is it coming? Why is she having bleeding? So vaginal bleeding is also another danger sign in pregnancy. Abdominal pain, I think of atopic pregnancies. They have right lower quadrant pain, really bad. Another condition that a patient comes in with abdominal pain could be placenta abruption, where they have a real rigid, hard-like abdomen when they come in and they're in they're in pain. Um, how about persistent vomiting? Yeah, 
hyperemesis gravidarum, that's another complication. And that this is never good where she has, she can't keep anything down. She's always what, vomiting. Um, epigastric pain, that has to do with pain. Um, um, it would be in the upper, uh, upper quadrant of the abdomen on usually on the right side. And um, that's significant because in preeclampsia, because that tells me my patient is deteriorating um, worse because now her liver is being enlarged and that's not good. Okay, so that is, that's like, a, we call that the sign that happens before um, she has a seizure. So that's not good. Um, severe persistent headaches, um, blur vision or dizziness, they have to do with preeclampsia also. Um, edema of the face and hands that's the first time that she's retaining fluid and so we, we want to make sure that we're um, up on that um, again I'm worried about preeclampsia and then if she has a chill uh, she has a fever which is 100.4 greater well that's not good that means she's got some kind of infection going on and then if she's got painful urination or reduced urine output yeah, if she's got a UTI and she's got um, an infection in the bladder, um, cystitis, I'm thinking about, um, then what happens is that, the, remember, the bladder lays underneath that uterus. And when the bladder gets inflamed, it inflames the uterus. And the uterus, what? The uterus becomes, she starts contracting. And you can lose a baby or go into preterm labor because of urinary problems, urination, um, pain, pain, infection. So that's not good. Okay. So what we always worry about is mom. Mom has mom, we have to take care of mom and make sure that mom is well in order that we keep this little baby, which I have here like in a little heart. Um, you know, we keep this this little guy here, her, um, in good shape. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and discuss about amniocentesis. Well, this is the removal of amniotic fluid from the uterus. So we're gonna go ahead, excuse me, we're gonna go ahead into the amniotic sac. Now, let me get my little marker here. Okay, and we're gonna go into the sac. See here, I see the needle going in. That's a little window. That's called a window. And so we're going to go into this little area here with our spinal needle. And don't forget, we're doing this under ultrasound guidance. So we go in and we're going to get a little sample. Now, this is a really good diagram. It's right comes right from your book. Um, you can see here the placenta and here's the sp spiral arteries. And here's the urine wall. And we're, again, we got the ultrasound transducer. We don't do this blindly. No, 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 no. And um, here's the bladder. You can see how the bladder and the uterus are so close together here. And then here's the vagina. Now, um, what I was going to say to you is that there's a lot of risk factors involved with this. Okay. And this is why we have to explain things to the patient. Because what happens is that you're going right into the sac. And so she could, unfortunately, lose a baby because of this test. We do it very cautiously. This this is a very, very, very thin needle. And um, we keep her on, you know, resting afterwards. We're going to monitor the baby's heart rate. And we're going to make sure she doesn't go into labor because she could go into labor after this test. So you think, oh, wow, this test has a lot of risk factors associated. Well, it does. But if you're an advanced maternal age patient and you really want to know if the baby is okay, uh, you want to get those chromosome analysis, it's a good test because it's very accurate. So we do this test between 12 and 13 weeks because you have to get the uterus up in over the sympathous pubis so we can see everything. So that usually it's about 12 to 13 weeks. And then, and don't forget the amniotic fluid now is forming. We have to get, in, we have to have enough fluid to actually take a sample. And so, you know, they, mommies usually, um, if they're, if they need to, they can do this test. It's a, it's a, you know, we come a long way in our tests.
Okay, so let's go into our different complications. Now, we have, these are the following that we're going to discuss. Hypermesis gravidarum, um, bleeding disorders, hypertension, and blood incompatibility. Between the mother and the fetus. Okay, so we're going to take them one by one. And the first one we talk about is hyperemesis gravidarum. Now, is called hyperemesis because it has excessive nausea and vomiting. This is not the normal, you know, morning sickness that a woman gets in the first trimester. This is excessive. This is going beyond. And a lot of times when they have a molar pregnancy, they have a tendency to have this condition. So it does impact fetal growth. Because don't forget, mom's not getting the nutrients um, that she needs. And the baby, therefore, is going to get less. Baby's uh, mom's dehydrated. And then you have reduced delivery of blood. And blood carries oxygen. So all this blood, oxygen, nutrients are not going to the fetus like they should. So it is a very serious complication of pregnancy. What's your treatment going to be? Well, let's correct the dehydration and the electrolyte or acid balance. Um, on these kind of patients, I'm going to give an anti-emetic, such as Reglan or Zofran. And we give that um, very cautiously, uh, but it, they do work very well for this type of patient. And then in extreme cases, they may have to have TPN or they, may, they have to be hospitalized. Yeah, um, they need to have be an IV. Um, I tell you, I had a patient, um, plenty of these kind of patients, really. So I get an IV on her, get some hydration, and get her her Reglan, and um, they seem to get a little better. And then I try to give them like a spoonful of a little spoonful of water, and my patient just throws it back up. Well, she wasn't ready yet, so we're just not going to give her that. Um, we have to be very careful. We watch them very closely. What you can do, because a lot of times their lips are really, really chapped, and you can see the skin just peeling off the lips, or on their teeth, they have this like yellowish film because they, don't forget they're not taking in water and they've been throwing up. And so they have this icky, even taste in their mouth. And so I usually take a washcloth and I soak it in some nice cold water for them. And then I just let them chomp, you know, put their mouths on it. And um, it helps, guys. It does. I mean, you know, I give them a little bit of feeling of water in the mouth. And a lot of times I just tell them, just spit it out. And they do feel better. They can get that icky film off their, um, out of, off their teeth. Yeah. So um, here's a little brain teaser. Now, this one, um, the uh, question is centered around the no regular nausea, vomiting, and pregnancy. Okay, so. The client expresses concerns related to nausea in the first trimester of pregnancy. Okay, so she comes into your clinic and she's saying, oh, nurse, um, I have this nausea, you know, and, and I'm only um, 10 weeks pregnant, you know, I'm in my first trimester. What can you tell me to do? What should the recommend, what recommendation or which recommendations should the nurse make? Well, the best one of these is to eat the crackers while still in bed in the morning. I have told a lot of ladies over the years, yes. And the reason why is because don't forget at night, they're not eating, they're not drinking. So you have a lot of what we call acid buildup. And when they get up, that is just laying there with an empty, empty stomach. And what happens then they could get up and they can just vomit. So eat the crackers, the crackers will absorb all that. And I try to tell them to eat unsalted saltines because so the regular saltines have a lot of salt in them. And I'm always worried that they would get too much extra salt. And then lay down and rest while a a nausea occurs. No, 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 no. Okay. I mean, they, you, you have this all day long. You just can't decide during the day I'm, I'm just going to rest whenever the nausea occurs because sometimes it occurs, it's with them all day. Um, eat more frequently throughout the day. No. Um, because that would just stimulate the um, the reflex again. So basically the best one, and we would never avoid foods containing ginger. No, it, I, I, I would want her to have like ginger ale, 
for ginger. That's another way too. So that that answer is incorrect. So, <laughs> excuse me. So the only good answer here is to eat the crackers. And we talked about that already. And so yes, eat crackers in the morning. Okay. Before you get your head off the bed. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about some bleeding disorders and during early pregnancy. That means in the beginning of pregnancy. And those could be your miscarriages or your, you know, we call them spontaneous ABs. They're not intentional. They're not scheduled. They happen, unfortunately. And we have several. We have threatened, inevitable, incomplete, complete, miss and recurrent. Now, the threatened one means she's threatening. Okay. So she, she calls and comes into the clinic and she's telling you, you know, I have a little bit of bleeding. I've got some, I got some slight cramping. Okay. I have light spotting, light cramping. Okay. So what we're going to tell her is to stay in bed, bed rest. And usually bed rest for two weeks will do it. That means and nothing in the vagina, absolutely nothing in the vagina for that long term. And hopefully whatever was start, whatever was starting to maybe come to to get come off or maybe it wasn't implanted right, um, that can happen. Um, sometimes they get like a blood clot um, when they implant. And so basically this way, um, that will dissolve, it breaks up and dissolves the cell as long as there's the body's at rest. Okay, so that's threatened. Um, inevitable just means I can't do anything to help the woman. Unfortunately, it's just that the cervix is open, the bag of water is co um, coming out, there's blood coming out. It's just, I can't, I can't help her. Incomplete means basically that you got, you have everything started, but it doesn't shed off everything. So what happens, she has to have a DNC done. And complete means just basically that everything came out. Okay. Now you have some them induce, uh, we call them therapeutic abortions, where those are done in the hospital. And basically, if you have like an amniocentesis and it shows that this fetus is incompatible with life, then mothers uh, want to abort. Um, a lot of times, too, if you have a, a woman who has CMV, um, will do a therapeutic abortion. Now, we have to go to an ethic committee. Oh, yeah. And we have to present our case. And we have diagnostic tests behind us to show that, yes, this woman needs to have a therapeutic um, abortion. Okay. Remember, it it grieves them terribly. It's hard on these ladies. Now here's right out of your textbook. And this is a good picture. And I love my pictures. And so the first one here is, is a threatened abortion. And it just shows, you see, she's just having light um, bleeding and she's having some cramping. Okay. Okay. Bed rest. Okay. This one here is the inevitable one in which I can't do anything to help her because do you see here how the cervix is open up and there's a lot of fluid coming out? Yeah, it, it's, I'm so sorry, but there's something I can do to stop this. And here you have an incomplete where right here, I have my marker. You can see where um, the fetus is coming out and here is it started to, here is some fluid and it hasn't completed itself, okay? So on this kind of patient, we definitely would be doing a DNC. It's always good after they have these um, ABs is that, or miscarriages, is that what happens, um, they, they, it's good to have a DNC, you know, a dilatation and carotage. Yeah. All right. So now how do we do our nursing care? Okay. So... We're always going to document the amount and character of the bleeding. Okay, what color blood is it? Is it bright red, dark red? Okay, then save anything that looks like a clot or tissue for evaluation by by a pathologist. Yeah, we send it. We send it. Now this is pretty hard to do. I will grant you. You're probably thinking, "Ooh, that's not very nice." But yeah, she goes home, and um, it's better to be home too. 
and we give them a sterile container. And what they do is anything that comes out and looks like a clot or tissue, please put it in the sterile container. Try not to touch it, um, the better. And then we can label it and send it to pathologists. And that's really good because then we know what's going on. The pathologist will look at it. Um, we always do a pad count if she's in the hospital with estimated amount of blood and uh, on the peri pad. So, you know, we go ahead and label, we put on our peri pad and every time we change a pad, we'll go ahead and um, note the time. And um, so we know how much, how, how often we are putting that pad on the, on the pad. Okay. Now monitor vital signs. Absolutely. Because what do I have to worry about with this lady? Uh, what about going into shock? Okay. So, and then you always keep your patient MPO. Um, it's always good because you never know if this patient has to go for um, surgery. And I'm thinking the DNC. All righty. Now here's your teaching. So this is after the procedure is done. And you, you want to tell her that report increased bleeding, take temperature every eight hours for three days, um, maybe take an oral um, iron supplement, okay? And then, because they're going to lose a lot of blood, um, don't have sexual activity uh, until we um, tell you, the providers tell you. And then, you know, I wanted to come back for a follow-up and then get on some contraception if she needs to. Um, pregnancy can occur before the first menstrual period returns after the after the abortion procedure. Okay, so you got to let them know that. And then I tell you, as a nurse, you have the responsibility of providing uh, comprehensive discharge instructions. Oh yeah, absolutely. And if you ever worked in a hospital, you know that uh, we have lots of. Checkoffs, okay, and you know we put in, you know, when's your doctor's appointment, and we make it there on the spot, so that we know that she's going to go to it. Very important that they have good follow up. So again, now emotional care. Yes, when anybody loses a baby, it is emotional. Anybody they go through the procedures, there is emotional because that's a baby. They lost the baby, so. We have support groups. We have spiritual support in the hospitals. There's a lot of community support groups. So they can help them get through the pregnancy loss. So that they, then they can focus on the next pregnancy. Okay, so here's a brain teaser for y'all. All right, so a woman at eight weeks pregnant, she calls to report cramping and a small amount of vaginal bleeding. What conditions should the nurse consider? Now, what I did for you is I put in like how many weeks she was pregnant in red because that gives me a clue. Okay, so now she's eight weeks. Okay, she calls and she's having cramping. Okay, cramping and a small amount of vaginal bleeding. See, I put that in red because that's very important when you're determining what it is. And before I even look at any of the answers, I could think to myself, oh, that would be a threatened abortion. So now I got it in my head. So now I look at the other ones. Well, I know it's not placenta abruption because abruption happens in later, later pregnancy. Okay. So that one I don't go for. Um, it's complete abortion. No, because it just tells me I'm having a small amount and I'm having a little bit of cramping. So everything's is still intact. It's just that I'm having some cramping. And then, so that's not good. And placenta previa would be um, bleeding in late pregnancy. So that wouldn't go. So I was right by saying it was B, a threatened abortion. And that's how you look at those questions. Let's go on to the next. Let's talk about atopic pregnancy. Oh, yeah, this is an interesting one because uh, I tell you, these little um, zygotes, when they're going through the fallopian tube, anything can happen, okay? And it can get stuck in there. So, um, and it causes tremendous, tremendous pain to mom. So, remember, 95% occur in the fallopian tube. Yeah. It does. And what happens is that 
when a zygote is going under what? Meiosis, okay. And it keeps, you know, cell dividing and it's traveling through the fallopian tube. If there's any kind of adhesion, scarring, um, infection, inflammation going on in, in the tubes, it can hinder that little ball of tissue from develop from going forward in the fallopian tube and find his place in the uterus. So, yes, and what happens when they get stuck in 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 the fallopian tube? The fallopian tube kind of swells, you know, and it causes pain, and that pain will the woman will feel, and is really sharp pain they call the they call the clinic complaining about pain and they're and i always ask them where's your pain in the lower um right hand right quadrant and i always ask them well when was your last menstrual period and they'll tell me it was like six weeks eight weeks ago bingo now those that, those answers to two little questions were very important. What am I going to do? I tell her to go to the hospital. Because the sooner you tell her to go to the hospital, the better we can save her too. If there's a delay and she waits, then it gets the, it's, it's going to keep cell dividing. It doesn't know to stop. So it keeps cell div dividing, gets bigger and bigger, it's going to rupture that too. And when she comes into the hospital, we're going to have to remove the entire tube because we she ruptured, okay? And we don't want her to rupture. We'd rather her come in, get the ultrasound real quick, and determine if it's truly an atopic, and then we can give her methotrexate, and that will dissolve that tissue, okay? And her body reabsorbs it, and we save the tube. Bingo. That's a nice way of doing it. Now, here's a picture of the most common sites for atopic pregnancy. And you can see here all the different sites. Okay. Now, sometimes the tissue will get really erratic and it could implant in the internal os or the, you could have it in the cervix. I mean, it's tissue. Um, it doesn't, doesn't really, you know, have a set program. Bob, we wanted to, where we wanted to implant, we want to implant in the upper portion of the uterus on the posterior wall. So um, these are topics here. And they, as you can see, the tube is not so big and the cells just keep dividing. All right. And um, it's, it just, it's hard. It hurts the, the mom a lot. Okay. Now, uh, here's a slide on the atopic pregnancy. It shows you the manifestations and the treatment. So here, what she's going to manifest with or show is going to be lower abdominal pain and light vaginal bleeding. Yeah, that lower abdominal pain is using the right quadrant. Now, the two ruptures, she's going to have sudden severe lower abdominal pain, which is never, never good. Vaginal bleeding. She may go into hypovolemic shock on you and shoulder pain may also be felt. Shoulder pain. And then treatment. Well, we know she's pregnant or as you do a pregnancy test, you can do a transvaginal ultrasound and, and see if it's an atopic. Then if it is, we're going to do a laparoscopic procedure. And if she ruptured, she's going to lose the tube. Okay. So you see priority is to control the bleeding and the actions you need to go on with either the treatment with methotrexate to stop the cell division or surgery to remove the pregnancy from the tube. The pregnancy is over, okay? You can't take, I had a student one time ask me, can you take the uh, cells and put them into the, into the uterus? No, the pregnancy is over. Okay, so here's your nursing tip again, guys. This is supporting and encouraging the grieving process in families who do suffer a pregnancy loss. Remember, they have to grieve. So a spontaneous AB or atopic, the loss of baby, and allows them, and you've got to allow them to resolve their grief. They have to resolve it to, to move on and, and be healthy about it. Now, I'm going to go over your signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock because 
um, in maternity, you could see on the topic how easy it would be for her if she ruptured to go, she'd be bleeding and then she would lose a lot of blood. And due to that, she could go into hypovolemic shock. Okay. So when you're talking about mom, the first sign you would see would be tachycardia. Okay. That means a rising weak pulse. Um, and then she could have tachypnea and she could have irregular um, breathing. And we call that air hunger. Yeah. So she's trying, you know, her body is trying to compensate, but she's having a tough time. And then you have hypotension, the blood pressure falls. So you can see when somebody's bleeding a lot, they're going to get depleted. And so when your the body senses that, the heart's going to start to pump more because the heart's saying, hey, I need a lot of blood. Okay. So uh, the heart says, I need more blood. So I'm going to pump more to get more. Then the and then your um, lungs are saying, well, I need two. So, I, so the lungs start to what? They, they get fast. They get tachypnea. And then she's sensing it. So she has these irregular respirations because the lungs are what, increasing so much. So she has what we call air hunger. And then because of all this, the blood pressure is going to fall. So her pulse is high, okay, but her blood pressure is low. So I hope that helped kind of see the body as what what it goes through when you go into shock. Now then, uh, if it's followed by the kidneys, the kidneys say, "Hey, what happened to me?" But you know, when you're depleted, when you're bleeding out, um, the heart is going to really demand more blood. So then the blood is now pumped, and so it's shunted from the um, kidneys and it goes to the heart, which you do want that to happen, okay? Because you can live with bad kidneys now you'd be on dialysis maybe but you know you need you need you need you need your heart to be working in order to pump to the body to keep everything going and especially your brain all righty and then you have pale and maybe the mucous membranes would be pale and how about cold clammy skin and then feeling a little faint yeah and by that time, you better you better be on top of your patients because these are, you know, pretty bad. Okay. All right. And I don't want to lose a patient. Never, never, never. Okay. We're going to talk about another complication, and that's called a molar pregnancy or a hygieniform mole. And what this is, is a bunch of cells. Okay. And so it happens when the chorionic villi, they abnormally will increase to try to develop vessels but guess what nothing nothing develops so these this is a great picture of a hydiniform mold and it, to me it looks like a bunch of grapes okay and so unfortunately you know this this situation can cause a lot of problems to mom it can cause hemorrhage it can cause clotting abnormalities, hypertension. And later in life, guys, these are patients that be very careful for cancer. So we follow these patients very carefully because HCG levels get very, very high. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen this happen where patients um, that are so excited to be pregnant. Honestly, they are. And so when they come in for their 10-week ultrasound, we know we look at their abdomen and we go, wow, it's a little bit bigger than normal. Okay, the uterus is larger than dates. And then we do the transvaginal ultrasound. And what, lo and behold, there is no fetal heart rate. No fetal heart rate. Because there is no fetus. And so that is so dramatic to the patient because maybe, you know, she's been trying or maybe, you know, she has all her family in the room and, and we don't see no fetus. Okay. We have to follow these patients very carefully for a full year. 
and we have they have to have blood work done like every three months because we have to see the HCG levels go back down to normal. Yes, they have to go back down to normal. So, yeah, this can be very dramatic. And then they have to wait to get pregnant. They have to wait a full year. And then they have to, because um, again, remember the HCG levels are so, so high. Because what's going on is such rapid, rapid cell division. And it's accelerated because there's nothing forming. So all you have is this bunch of tissue. Okay. And you can see in, the, in right here, see all these? Yeah, these are just tissue that kept multiplying, 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 because it doesn't know to stop. So um, you have to basically, you know, you have to do a DNC on this type of patient. Now, yes, it is dramatic. They need to grieve about it. And then they need to be told that we got to follow you carefully and you cannot get pregnant for a full year. Yeah. All right, so on this, here's all the manifestations that she can have, she's bleeding, she's got rapid uterine growth like we talked about, um, your failure to detect the heartbeat. Now, those, a lot of times, those aren't good, those are test, good test questions. Um, signs of hyperemesis gravidarum. Yeah, we said that, right? Um, because they would, they, yeah, that kind of makes sense if you think about it because they have so much cell division going on, so much increase of the uh, hormone, human um, gonotrophin, that yes, they, they, they're prone to hypermesis gravidera. And they can get gestational hypertension and they have a high levels of HCG, the human chorionic gonotrophin hormone. And then you can see that it looks like a snowstorm too. See this that that picture? Yeah, yeah. It's like a snowstorm. You know, ever been a snowstorm that you can't see is so thick and everything. And then, unfortunately, there's no developing fetus. There's no heartbeat. So what are you going to do? You have we have to evacuate the uterus, and we do that by a dilatation and curettage. So it's called dilatation evacuation. Yeah. All right. So now those were all bleeding disorders of early pregnancy. And now I'm going to discuss bleeding disorders of late pregnancy. So that means like 20 weeks and beyond. So one is called placenta previa. And just like it sounds, the previa, the placenta is presenting first, previa. Okay. So you have this abnormal um, implantation of the placenta. The placenta it dropped down too far. It dropped down near the internal os. And so what happens is when she maybe moves or she contracts a little bit, um, she has this bright red bleeding, okay, bright red. And it's painless bleeding. See, I highlighted all that on this slide for you to see because that's important. So I would write down in my notebook, placenta previa, painless bright red bleeding. Okay. And we're going to go over the different types of placenta previa, um, marginal, partial, or total, or complete, we call it. Now, here's a picture. Okay. So here, um, let me get my little pointer in the right place. Okay. And so here, see the placenta? The placenta is before the head. Okay. So a lot of times this type of baby would not be in a vertex presentation where that means vertex means head first it would be more in a breech presentation because the buttocks is a lot smaller than the head head is big so there's kind of a tight squeeze down here for the placenta to be there and for the head to be there now and it's bright red bleeding we talked about is because you see the placenta is so low, it doesn't have far to come out, down the sound into the cervix, out of the cervix, into the vagina. And we see bright red. Alrighty. So again, there's no pain with this. No pain. Okay. Now, if I gave you a little brain teaser, so let's put our little thinking caps on. 
the pregnant client has a diagnosis of placenta previa. So, so she's been diagnosed, but then she's coming into your clinic. So you're probably a triage nurse. And when reviewing interventions with her, which would not be appropriate for this patient. Now, I put not in red because that's the, the key word in this whole question is not. So that means that three are, one is not. Okay. So I'm going to look at my choices. Well, I know that weekly biophysical profile would be okay because that's an ultrasound that's not invasive. And that would be good to see if the placenta moved or not. Okay. So that's okay. Now, um, I'm going to skip over B and go to C, bed rest with bathroom privileges. Well, that would be okay. Remember the word not. Hmm. You know, a lot of students, when they see that, they say, well, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember her saying that, you know, but no, it, the, the question is saying, which would not be. So, and then consent for cesarean delivery. Oh yeah, we're always prepared guys, especially with these type of patients because they come in, they, they're bleeding and we got to get the baby out. So we're already ready for cesareans. So the only one that would fit into not it would be daily contraction stress test because I do not, I would not put the patient through a contraction stress test because I make, when I do that, this is um, a test and we give Pitocin to make the patient contract a little bit to, to, to see if the baby reacts to the contraction. Now, I would not put, I would not get Pitocin to this kind of patient. Never, 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 never get Pitocin, which is your oxytocin, to a patient with placenta previa. I do not, now write this down, I do not want to have this patient contract. Because when she contracts, think about it, when she contracts, she's going to bleed. You see what this placenta is, is she's going to bleed. That's not good. Patient go into hypovolemic shock on you and you lose the baby too at the same time. So that's why you have to be careful when you're looking at these kind of questions and there's plenty of them. What's the question asking me? Now write that down, that sentence. What is the question asking me? Okay, it's true. So the question is asking you which would not be appropriate and that would be B. Okay. Now let's go on and talk about placenta abruptio. All right, so, or abruptio placenta. So this is where the placenta, now the poor little placenta was in the right place, okay? But see here, here's your hemorrhage, see? See how here the placenta came off the decidua or the endometrium, and now there's a bleed. And it's a lot of blood, okay? So this blood now has a little way to travel down. And by the time it comes out of the vagina, it's going to be more dark red, okay? Because again, it had a little more time to travel down and be exposed. So um, this baby is in jeopardy, okay? Because the baby needs the nutrients and oxygen from the placenta. Remember that from like chapter two, okay, or chapter three, okay? And so you had to basically get this baby out before the baby dies. Now, the placenta abruptions can happen from a car accident, a trauma, any kind of trauma. Maybe she got punched in the stomach. Uh, maybe she fell, had a heart fall, and what happens is the placenta came right off the endometrium. Not good. Not good situation. And I have here another picture shows you, and I highlighted a dark red bleeding with pain. Now, this 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 uh, condition has pain. So you write down on your paper, um, placenta abruption, painful, dark red bleeding. And yes. You can see here, dark red bleeding, okay? And yes, it changes when she, like, when you put her on the table and you put the monitor on, it changes, her abdomen will look different and it'll be hard. 
and it'll be like a board like we say board like is like a board okay it's really 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 rigid all right so here's your complication of risk so i put down placenta previa and here you know she could have an infection um postpartum hemorrhage you know this this type of placenta this placenta previa causes could, could cause now listen up listen up now could cause the patient to have a postpartum hemorrhage and the reason why is because when the placenta is laying so low it made all those muscles in the in her perineum weaken and so it, it weaks it, it makes the uterus quite weak and so when after she delivers she would have what we call weaker contractions and she would have a soft boggy uterus and that could cause her to have a postpartum hemorrhage now and we'll go oh, we'll we'll discuss that more in a later chapters abrupt shield placenta i mean she if she had hypertension it could cause her, her placenta to abrupt why well, we talked about um let's see how about cocaine alcohol use yes we didn't talk about that and we didn't talk about cigarette smoking and if she doesn't eat right, poor nutrition, because again, the placenta has to form. And what mom eats and was doing in the um, during the excuse me embryonic and fetal development stages is very important to how everything developed. And then we talked about blows the abdomen if she's a product of um, IPV, which is interpart intimate partner violence. And then prior history of placenta abruptions. I would want to know that. And any kind of folate deficiency. Excuse me. All right. So let's do a little brain teaser. So you have a 33-week pregnant woman. And she's in the emergency department. And she comes in. And she's got painless, painless vaginal bleeding. What nursing action is contraindicating? Now, okay, now she's coming into your ER and she already has a diagnose, diagnosis of, um, no, she doesn't. See, let me go back to the question. So she came into your ER and she's got painless vaginal bleeding. Okay, as a nurse, I know that painless vaginal bleeding could be a sign of placenta previa. So um, until you know, until you rule it out, um, you don't put your fingers and do a vag exam several vag exams because if you put your fingers up the several vag exam um to do one you would what make her bleed okay so your nursing tip is pain is an important symptom yes remember previa placenta previa painless painless abrupt shield placenta painful okay so I think I think I got it. How, did you get that? Okay. Now you can always go into your HESI book. I put here page two fourteen. They have a good chart comparison between the placenta previa and abruptio placenta. If you need more. Okay. Now you got to take care of this lady. You're the nurse. You're gonna be taking care of her. So how are you gonna? What you're gonna do? You always document your blood levels. Okay. I'm going to really monitor her vital sign. Oh, yeah, including a strict INO. Okay, I want to make sure her kidneys are working properly also. Observe for pain and uterine rigidity or tenderness. Now, that's important because a placenta abruptio has uterine rigidity and tenderness. It's board-like. And I keep saying that because that's what a lot of questions, especially NCLEX likes to use those terms. Now verify your orders for your blood grouping and um, cross-matching. Okay, so, um, and you get a consent form for blood. Okay, um, monitor, you have your IV going. So if it's, it's supposed to be 150 mLs per hour, it better be at 150. And you have those, and you, you all have those pumps now that you can set them at. Um, if I need to, prepare for surgery. Oh, yes. And you know I have my fetal monitor has been on. Okay. Um, definitely. I have to know the fetal my heart rate 
and should be between 110 to 160. And I need to know if she's having any type of contractions. Okay. And then, of course, I'm going to monitor laboratory results, including coagulation studies. Because, you know, remember, she's more prone to what? To thrombophlebitis. So I'm going to make sure. I'm going to give her oxygen by mask and prepare for newborn resuscitation. Um, because these type of conditions um, can cause a newborn to get less um, oxygen. And so he was going to have a hard time when he's born because he's already had been depleted. Kind of makes sense. Okay, I'm going to stop here for a minute. You all take a, a, a little break and I'll be right back. I'm going to stop my sharing and I'll be right back with you. Okay, thank you. There again, I want to continue now. I'm going to share my screen with you and let's continue talking about some complications. All righty, so here's lesson plan 5.2, and this is my objectives for you. Describe antipartum complications, their treatment and their nursing care, and discuss the management of concurrent medical conditions during pregnancy. Okay, so let's get our thinking caps back on and let's continue. Okay, we're going to talk about hypertension during pregnancy. And this is something that you probably have heard about or maybe had a family member who had it, and it's called preeclampsia. And preeclampsia is when they come in with blood pressure that has now increased significantly um, and also uh, have protein in their urine. They may have persistent headaches and some dizziness and um, is, a, is a pretty serious condition. Now, if it continues and there's no treatment given, then she could go into a condition called eclampsia. And eclampsia happens when now the brain is involved and she starts having seizures. Very serious condition. It usually occurs in the second half of the pregnancy because the placenta has been shown that the placenta is the culprit. Yeah, the spinal arteries that we talked about, remember? Well, they're the ones that can cause the blood pressure to skyrocket. And of course, we talked about protein, the urine, and low platelets, or called thrombocytopenia. Now, I put this slide in here because it talks about blood pressure. So we use the 3015 rule. So say that, which means, let me let me explain that 3015 rule before I go on. That means an increase over the baseline blood pressure of 30 millimeters of mercury or more systolic. And for the diastolic, it's 15 millimeters of mercury increase. So say she came in, um, remember that very first visit, maybe she was 10 weeks and her blood pressure was like 110 over 70. And then the next visit she came in and went up to maybe one, 120 over 80. Okay. And you're going, hmm, let's see, we're going to watch it closely. We're going to make sure that we dipstick that urine to see if we have any protein and ask her if she has any headaches, and she denies anything. Then she comes in around 22 weeks, and she's now blood pressure, 140 over 90. Significant increase. Do we have a, a an increase of that 30 over 15 rule? Yes, we do. So now we're going to test her protein, for her urine for any protein, and sure enough, there's the protein. And then she might say, you know, nurse, I have, a, I get headaches and, you know, I took a Tylenol, but Tylenol doesn't seem to help it at all. Okay. That's very significant. Now she is headed, she is in preeclampsia. All righty. So let's give a little brain teaser here. So you have a woman who is at 35 weeks and she's been diagnosed with preeclampsia. 
Now her blood pressure had been running 140 over 100, 160 over 110. And she reports a headache, she has journalized edema, and she's got three plus protein in her urine. Hmm. What would be the most appropriate environment for this woman? Now, again, you're thinking, oh, she got preeclampsia. Oh, let's see, let's see the let me see my choices. But now think about that question. What's the question asking you? The question is asking you the most appropriate environment for this woman. So we know this woman should be kept uh, quiet. She should have a private room. Okay, so let's do the choices. Um, go home on partial bed rest with a private duty nursing care. No. Um, a labor room on strict bed rest. No, she doesn't need to be in the labor unit. She'd be in the high risk unit, um, what we call fro, but we're not we're not in the labor unit. There's too much noise, and she needs to have quiet environment. Um, semi private room on bed rest. No, she needs to be in a private room. Remember, we we said that. So, the other choice would be private hospital room with bathroom privileges. Bingo. That's the environment that we would want for our patient. Patient needs very little stimulation. Usually they like a dark room because um, a lot of times they have those headaches and the headaches um, are, are aggravated by a light. All right. So what are your, some risk factors for gestational hypertension? Well, first pregnancy is a risk factor. And usually those young girls, like 17, 18, 19, with their first pregnancy, they can get hit with preeclampsia. And they're very sick, by the way. And usually they are, they have to be delivered pretty early. Um, obesity is another one. Um, family history of gestational hypertension. Yes, remember that family history that we needed to know? Um, family history. And then um, multifetal, she has twins, triplets, quads that also can work into a risk factor for gestational hypertension. Um, if she had chronic hypertension, that means she had it, you know, but way before she came in being pregnant, then yes. Remember, those are the patients that I said in the very beginning, um, we would red flag them, you know. We're going to watch you a little closely. Maybe we're going to have you come in a little bit more often. All right. And she came in already with chronic renal disease. They're also a big risk factor for gestational hypertension. And of course, diabetes can be another risk factor for gestational hypertension. So your manifestations um, would be hypertension, of course, um, edema, remember, hands and face are the first places where you see edema. And then you have protein in the urine. And then she has um, abnormal blood clotting and central nervous system. Uh, so it can be affected. And then the eyes, she can get um, blur vision, double vision. She can see spots before her eyes. And then urinary tract, she can get that. The kidneys can get affected. She's already spilling protein in her urine. So um, we have to watch that because she could go into renal failure. And then respiratory system and the GI and the liver because the liver can enlarge and that can be a, um, the sign of a liver enlargement can be epigastric pain. And that's when it gets, she's getting worse. Okay. So um, you might hear the, the um, saying health syndrome. And HELP syndrome, so your H would be your hemolysis, EL would be your elevated liver enzymes, and LP would be your low platelets. And that's right in your textbook also. And so you want to make sure that you're going to be testing um, to keep an eye on all of this. So your lab work would be a CBC, you have clotting factors, you would have liver enzymes so that you know what's going on. So what's your management going to be? Well, it also depends upon the severity of the hypertension and how the fetus is really doing and how the fetus is growing. 
if we find the fetus is not growing properly and the, we and the, and the fetus is in what we call a hostile environment that's what us nurses call it um then it's it probably and mom's getting worse her blood pressure keeps uh, escalating then she needs to be delivered okay i mean i had a patient let me share this with you real quick i had a patient that um, was, she was young she was having her first baby and she has severe hypertension she has severe edema and she had feet you, her feet was so swollen you see my hand here the top of her foot was so swollen that her little toes just looked like little ditches at the end and we called them elephantitis because they look like an elephant feet if you if you know what i mean and so it was so much swelling and we were trying, she was on magnesium sulfate, and we were trying to get another day, the other day, because she was um, preterm. And so we were trying to get time. And so we got enough time where we could give the uh, mom, uh, Bethamethasone, two injections, 24 hours apart. And that helped increase the production of surfactant in the fetal lungs so that when the baby was born, he had more of a chance of being able to breathe um, when he was born. So in labor and delivery, we try for every, every day, okay, every minute, okay? Things can change. When, like, say at 2 p.m., she was stable, she was doing okay, and by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, she, she was bottoming out, and she needs to be delivered quickly. So this is what happens, Okay, so again, treatment but is focusing on uh, maintaining blood flow to mom's vital organs. Yes, and then and to end the placenta because don't forget we have the baby there, and um, and then like I said, you know, we like our my patient I just described to you, you know, we just fought for every minute, um, and then the main thing too is we wanted to prevent a convulsion. Because once a convulsion um, starts, the brain gets uh, affected by that, and we don't want that to happen. Okay. And so the medicine of choice on that would be to um, give her magnesium sulfate. And uh, magnesium sulfate um, is given to prevent seizures. All right. So we have a patient that is on our unit. And she has, so she developed preeclampsia. We're going to get that magnesium sulfate in very quickly. So we give like a four gram loading dose. Now it could be a two gram loading dose. It just depends upon the physician order. But we have given four gram loading dose. And um, it gets in there pretty quick. You have to be careful with magnesium because it is a central nervous system depressant. And so it can shut down vital organs at the same time if she gets too much. That's called magnesium sulfate toxicity. Alrighty. So because of the threat of magnesium sulfate toxicity, we are going to have calcium gluconate at bedside. Now, what calcium gluconate does, it reverses the effect of magnesium. So it's always good to have it. I always had a vial of ca a calcium gluconate. I had it actually taped to my patient's bed. So at any time I was able to pull that off and to inject if I needed to. Because um, if you don't act quickly, she her respiratory system can shut down. So I have that. So you want to be sure that when you have a patient on magnesium that you're monitoring very, very closely. You have your IV, your main line, then you have your um, magnesium sulfate going. All these are on pumps. And then you have a Foley catheter in. So you're, you are watching her kidney function, making sure she uh, pees at least 30 mLs per hour. And then you have... Um, as I said, you have magnesium and you're going to test her reflexes. <laughs> Excuse me. You're going to test her reflexes. And uh, the the, the uh, patella reflex is most easy is one to elicitate. 
So what you're going to do is you're going to, you know, get your position of your of the leg. You support the leg and you let the patient know. A lot of times they want to help support it. And you say, no, let it go limp. And then you take your little hammer and then you can go ahead and test her reflex. Now, if she does not have any reflex, now listen up, no reflex, that's a sign of magnesium sulfate toxicity. Okay, so yes, I'm going to check my the reflex of my patient every hour. So, um, I wanna I want to be on top of this patient at all times, so she does get one to one nursing care. I'm also gonna you know do daily weights on my patient. Now a lot of these patients we don't even get out of bed, but the beds today have weights. They have a scale in them. Okay, so that's pretty neat. And so then you can do a, 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 a weight on her. Um, I'm always going to be checking, you know, I have a Foley catheter in, but I'm also going to be checking for protein every hour also. And again, we're going to watch the fetus. We're going to have a monitor on her. And yes, in high risk units, um, what we did, we had a fetal monitor on her the whole time and we can see the baby and make sure because see the baby's going to get that magnesium also going to get the effects of it. So a lot of times babies will get very flat. They'll get, they'll lose some of variability, the beat to beat. And so you have to be very careful with that too. And we want to make sure we're getting enough, uh, we get fetal activity. We get some fetal movement in there. Once, Cause as long as the baby's moving and his heart rate goes up a little bit, then we know he's okay. He or she is doing okay inside. And then we can continue with the treatment. But once we have a problem, with the fetus and we have problems with mom it's time for delivery or if we have problems with mom we're going to deliver or we have problems with baby we're going to deliver okay so nursing care focus is that you're going to assist the woman to attain prenatal care all women should get prenatal care this is why we want to get them in there, get them into the clinics to make sure we get them vitamins and talk about nutrition, like I talked about, and to take their blood pressure, okay? We want to be on top of things, okay? Now, a woman can die because of preeclampsia, okay? A woman can die because she has uncontrolled diabetes, so you have to keep all, this is why prenatal care is so, so very important. We have to help her realize that she needs to come in for, you know, different therapies. If she needs to have non-stress tests done on the baby, then she needs to come in. And you have to explain. I have found over the many years that as long as I explain the procedures to my patient, they were compliant. It's when you don't explain it and they and you just tell them, well, you know, you're going to have to come in three times a week that they're going to say, man, I have a life. You know, I, I can't make it here three times a week. But you tell them why, then they always will come in. Um, and then you want to do good follow-up with them too. And then you always want to make sure they're taking their medications as prescribed. Okay, so let's move on. I'm going to move on into bleeding incompatibilities. Okay, well, we, I'm going to go over this. Um, we, we, in, uh, in the chapters to come, we go over this even more so. But I'm just going to give it to you in a, in a little snapshot. And we got an RH negative blood, okay? Our mommy is RH negative and baby is RH positive, okay? Remember, they don't mix very well. Negative and positives don't mix. So we have to uh, make sure that baby remains safe from mom's negative blood. So um, let me just tell you a little bit about RH negative blood. It is an autosomal recessive trait. I mean, receptor trait. Uh, RH positive blood, on the other hand, is a dominant trait. So you see more of the RH positive blood types. That's why they're all in blood banks are always, always looking for a um, RH negative blood type. Yeah, they always put their flags out for that. Now with pregnancy, if you have an RH negative mom and you have an RH positive baby, those two don't get along very well. And sometimes we don't want this to happen, but you can have a seepage of blood. 
Okay, that means that some of baby's blood can seep into what? Mom's circulation. Now, mom's blood is going to go, what's going on? So it's like, okay, so this hand is mom. Okay, here's mom. Okay, here's baby. Okay, so now they have the little seepage, you know, and so mom's antibodies go, wow, look at this good, juicy RH positive. I'm going to go get those nice erythrocytes. Okay, and so now I'm going to eat up all those RBCs. Okay, which are called erythrocytes, by the way. Okay, so she eats up all these beautiful RBCs. What happens to baby? Oh, I dwindled out. Uh, and he becomes anemic. Bad news. Okay, so how can we keep this from happening? We give mom broken. And another name for Rogam is RHD immune globulin, which a lot of tests, questions, likes to put RHD immune globulin. So now you know. All right, so let's move on. So this is a, just a, uh, what I just explained to you. This is a PowerPoint on it. And it just, it can cause that baby to be severely, severely anemic. And sometimes so, so much that the baby has to have an intrauterine transfusion, blood transfusion. Now, they only do that in severe cases, okay? Yeah. But it, it that has happened. But we can prevent this from happening by Rogan. And the condition, a baby um, is born and is severely anemic, the condition is called erythroplastosis for towels. And this is a great little picture. And it shows you here of the baby. And it shows you RH positive. So you see the little RH positive cells here? <laughs> and then here's mom circulation. And these are, these are negatives. And so what happens is that they mix and we don't want them to mix. And so mom's circulatory, those antibodies cross the placenta. And what happens is that baby gets anemic. Okay. Not a good, not good. So we're going to give mom real gam. It's usually given about 28 weeks um, into the pregnancy. And then we give it after she delivers. And we, within 72 hours of delivery to the mom. Okay. All right, so it requires Rogam to be given. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop my suffering. Yeah. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and continue. All right, so we were talking about erythroblastosis, and basically giving mom Rogam about 28 weeks, and then she'll get Rogam again after she delivers this baby, before she goes home. It has to be within 72 hours of delivery to the mom. Now, also, with RH negative moms, if they have an amniocentesis, or they have a topic, or they have a spontaneous abortion, they also will get um, Rogan. Anytime that an RH negative woman experiences bleeding during pregnancy, she will get Rogan. Okay. So, um, we're going to really watch mom during this time. Um, fetal assessment tests must be done throughout the pregnancy, like the non-stress tests. It's non-invasive tests. We're just monitoring the baby and seeing the baby moves. And if his heart rate does accelerate during the movement. And then again, I talked about already intrauterine um, transfusion uh, could be done if it was really severely anemic fetus. Okay. And it has been done in the past. All righty. So let's go in from bleeding disorders. We're going to go into diabetes. So this is another complication during pregnancy. And we know that diabetes, you have type one, which is more pathological. Okay. And then you have type two, which is your insulin resistance. And basically um, you have the pre gestational diabetic, either type one or type two, and then you have your gestational diabetic. Now, that means that she got diabetes during pregnancy. That's why we call it gestational diabetes. And the screening occurs 
around say 20 weeks um that's pretty early sometimes about 23 weeks 24 weeks we do the screening and then if she fails the screening test she'll get a three-hour glucose tolerance test and basically glucose intolerance with onset of during pregnancy they're going to get their testing and in a true gestational diabetic mom um it usually will resolve itself like six weeks postpartum. Okay. And now six weeks postpartum, if she hasn't converted, then we're going to refer her then to her primary doctor or to an endocrinologist. And they, that's a doctor that specializes in the metab in metabolism, especially diabetes. So, um, but with normal gestational diabetes, it can it will convert back to normal. But I always tell my patients too that um, they are predisposed. Okay, if they had just um, diabetes, gestational diabetes later in life, um, when they get uh, uh, older, like I said, later in life. Um, they are prone to type 2 diabetes. So they need to make a lifestyle choice and some changes and a little exercise to their life and they can control their sugar a lot better. Okay, so glucose metabolism, you have your hormones, estrogen and progesterone, and then you have insulinase, and it, which is an enzyme, and then you have increased prolactin hormone, which you need for lactation. And so what happens is that they have two effects. They have they can increase the resistance of cells to insulin and or, and or they can increase the speed of insulin breakdown. So these are those hormones of pregnancy that we have circulating. So that's why it and th don't forget too the placenta has human placental um lactogen which also predisposes mom to gestational diabetes. So that's why in the very beginning, we talked about good nutrition with mom and going over her diet. This is why. Okay, so now let's do a little brain teaser. Okay, get your thinking caps on. So what would normally happen to a woman's blood glucose level during pregnancy? Well, we know it doesn't decrease, so X that one out. It doesn't remain stable, and it it would fluctuate. But the 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 better choice, because fluctuates means goes up and down, so it doesn't go down. It would elevate, and so the answer would be one. All right. Now I think you you see the picture. So again, pre-existing diabetes. Is a major risk. So they, what that means is they come in with the type one di diabetic patient, type one. So there are major risks for congenital anomalies to occur from too much blood sugar circulating during what period? The embryonic period of development. And so remember, that's like the first what? First eight weeks of pregnancy. And so that's when the embryo is doing all the major developments of all the vital organs. And so if mom has um, type 1 diabetes and she's not controlled very well, then she definitely has a problem and it can affect the development of the embryo. And so it affects their, uh, since it affects their development, they, if something goes wrong, then they basically can have be born with a congenital anomaly. Alrighty. So, if a woman cannot increase her insulin production, now think about it. Remember, your insulin comes from your pancreas. So, if she cannot increase her insulin production, she will have periods of hyperglycemia. That means she has periods of high blood sugar. Because the fetus is continually drawing glucose from the mom, she will also experience hypoglycemia between meals and the night time. All right. So during her second and third trimester, the fetus is at risk for organ damage from too much blood sugar, hyperglycemia.
And the fetal tissue has increased the tissue resistance to mater maternal insulin action. So this baby gets all this blood sugar, all this from all this from the mom, and it will affect his tissue. He if he will have problems. And we call these babies get very, very big, by the way, and they're called macrosomic babies. All right, so here are some factors that are linked to gestational diabetes. If you have a mom who who is obese, she's at risk. Um, a large infant at risk. Uh, maternal age older than 25. It seems like it got younger. Usually it's old, about 35, but but in this case could be older than 30, 25. And then previously unexplained stillbirth or infant having congenital anomalies. And there you go. There's your type one. And then you have your history of gestational diabetes in a previous pregnancy. And yes, that's why we want to know her history because if she's had uh, gestational diabetes before, the chances are pretty great that she can have it again. And so we would do the screening on this type of patient sooner, you know, about 20 weeks like we talked about. Okay, because we got to, we got to really get hold uh, early if she is um, going to be a, another gestational diabetic. And then remember her family history, okay, of diabetes. All righty. So here is your baby that has macrosomic, which means a large infant, okay, large baby. And you can see he's quite, quite swollen, quite edematous in his face and his and his abdomen you can see the abdomen quite um, big his whole all his extremities quite big his head is quite big too and this kind of baby they're very prone to hypoglycemia at birth and so these babies get a um, blood glucose test right away okay and a lot of times we'll do them Whew, excuse me We'll do them right in the labor room. Okay. So what's the treatment? Well, go oh, going back to this microsomic baby, I just want to add in, hopefully the, the mode of de delivery would be a C-section. All right. Let me get some water here. <coughs> All right. Because if it's a vaginal delivery, it can cause problems to both mom and baby. Mom can end up with a fourth degree episiotomy with even some upper lacerations and vagina and lacerations. And then baby can be born with some um, shoulder dystocia, which means the head is out, but the shoulders are stuck and then end up having to break the clavicle. So it's never good. Okay. So here's your treatment. <coughs> Excuse me. The diet is your first line of management. Yeah, we're going to start with, you know, again, food diary, what you're eating, and decrease the amount of sugar in her diet. A lot of times that ha that does work, along with maybe 30 minutes of exercise, it does work. I'm going to have her monitor her blood glucose levels. And she wants to be with, you know, with in that norm, and make sure her fasting, you know, glucose is, is, is good, and then uh, make sure her postprandials are good. Um, I'm going to be monitoring her urine also for ketones, and then and make sure she does her exercise, and then come in for fetal assessment tests, which the big one would be the non-stress tests. All righty, so when you have a patient like this, and she's in labor now, um, we're going to have an infusion, maybe, of some dextrose if needed. And it's all according to, because usually we use LR or lactate ringers, but maybe the doctor may want to put a little bit of glucose to it. So we may have D5 um, with it. So we'll just see what, you know, what happens. Um, going to give her probably regular insulin um, through the IV. Or we could give it um, sub Q and then assess her blood glucose levels hourly and adjust the insulin accordingly. Now, insulin does not cross the placenta. It's about the only thing that doesn't because it's a large molecule, by the way. 
Okay, so let's take care of this baby now, whose mother is a gestational diabetic. So again, like I said before, this baby is prone to hypoglycemia. So just put this down because this is a pretty important concept for you. And basically, is a blood glucose value about 45 milligrams per deciliter. Now, some folks say at term, if it falls below 40, um, it's hypoglycemia in a preterm baby if it falls below 30. But um, right now, is this, this, this says 45. It's all according to what book you're reading. Um, respiratory distress can happen. Yes, if a baby is, when a baby has um, born to a mom who has gestational diabetes, um, can have problems breathing at birth. Um, injury related to macrosomia, that would be the clavicle. Um, it could have some problems being delivered if, if she's doing a vaginal delivery and it's a large baby. And then you're going to monitor this baby's glu glucose for the first 24 hours after birth. Absolutely. And then these babies sometimes are kept in the NICU just to make sure that um, they, they do okay after delivery. And breastfeeding, yeah, the moms can breastfeed. Okay, so now we're going to go from diabetes, we're going to go into heart disease. And yes, manifestations um, are... Um, they have increased level of clotting factors, and then they have increased risk of thrombus. And if a woman's heart, now think about it, if a woman's heart cannot handle the increased workload, remember, cardiac output increases 45% in the pregnant woman. So what happens if she can't handle that? Then she fills up with fluid and she can have a condition called congestive heart failure which is never good. So when mom has congestive heart failure, there is reduced blood flow from the placenta to the baby. And so the baby then ha suffers because of that. Well, we don't want that. So what are some signs of congestive heart failure during pregnancy? Well, they have persistent coughs. Um, their lungs are kind of moist when you listen to lung sounds. Um, they could be fatigued or fainting on exertion, um, difficulty breathing on exertion, um, some orthopenia when they get up too quick, and then they have severe pitting edema of the lower extremities or generalized edema. Remember, in lower extremities, the, um, they fill up with fluid on the bottom of more dependent on their legs, and the blood doesn't flow back um, to, back to the heart. And then you have palpitations and then you have changes in the fetal heart rate because mom's having a problem. Baby's going to have a problem and babies can suffer dramatically in their growth because of this. And they're called an IUGR baby, which means they are intrauterine growth restricted babies. So what's your treatment? Well, we definitely got to have her under the care of an obstetrician. Um <clears throat> and the cardiologists. And um, priority of care is really limiting physical activities. So she won't be able to continue go working. No, she'll have to rest more at home. We may put her on some um, drugs. Um, she may be on maybe those um, beta and genetic blockers or anticoagulants, diuretics. Yeah, and she's gonna be watched very closely by the cardiologists. Vaginal delivery is preferred. Now, you probably think, hmm, um, but because it carries less risk for infection. And this kind of patient um, is more prone to an infection and from surgery or respiratory complications. Again, putting her um, under for a surgery is never good either. So that's why we'd rather have her have a vaginal birth. And this kind of patient would be monitored very closely for labor pain because we wouldn't want this patient to be in labor pain, have too much pain with the labor. So we'll probably end up with an epidural, okay? Um, you, as you can tell, this patient would be a very high risk patient when, when they have come in with cardiac disease. Now, anemia. Now, anemia can be a very bad thing, and a lot of ladies are anemic um, because the, when mom is anemic, 
there is less blood flow to the fetus. So be very, very careful in pregnancy. The range does fall from like 10, can go from 10 um, to 14 grams per deciliter. In a normal non-pregnant woman, your um, average of your hemoglobin is from 12 to 16. So again, reduced amount of red blood cells reduces the amount of oxygen to all cells. Okay, so we have four types of anemia during pregnancy. You have two that are um, basically nutrition, and you have two that are genetics. So the two that are nutrition-based would be your iron deficiency diet, okay, anemia, or your folic acid deficiency anemia. Now your two genetics in falls, remember, sickle cell disease, and then the other one is uh, thalassemia, and um, basically thalassemia is a uh, blood disorder that involves involving less than normal amounts of oxygen protein. Okay, so oxygen that carries protein. So, um, but those kind of patients, the fetus doesn't seem to get affected, but um, thank goodness, but um, we have to be very careful with these patients. So when you fall under nutritional nutritional anemias, the symptoms are she gets tired, easily fatigued. Okay. And then again, her skin and mucous membranes could be pale. She could have shortness of breath, a pounding heart, and a rapid pulse with severe anemia. So we're going to basically put her on some iron supplements. Okay. And we make sure that we educate our patients when they're on iron. Okay, because what happens is their their stools can turn like a dark green or black, and that would be very upsetting to a patient if she didn't know. Um, but and, you know, citrus fruits are good. You know, she can eat citrus fruits; they kind of enhance the absorption of iron. The main thing you got to tell them is do not take iron supplement with milk or antacids like tums. Because a lot of ladies, you know, they eat Tums during pregnancy because of the heartburn, but that's not good. But um, we just don't want them to take milk with these iron because the, actually the calcium itself impairs the absorption of the iron. So they'll be on, you know, some good iron supplements and they have to continue um for about three months after the anemia has been corrected. So you got to tell them to. Okay. Once you get, we get you back up, we build you back up to where you, where, where you want you to be so you can feel better. So you don't be so tired anymore. You had to continue this treatment for three months afterwards. Now, a lot of ladies don't like that because what does iron do to the body? Well, it causes you to be constipated. And so during pregnancy, you have a tendency to be constipated anyway. And so when you're on iron, it really makes that much worse. So a lot of times with this, the compliance is a factor. That's your barrier is getting this patient to actually take it. And then also if they like to drink like tea, they cannot drink tea while on iron supplements. All right. Now I've got our folic acid deficiency anemia. Well, this is pretty important because remember folic acid um, prevents open neural tube defects. So we have to make sure that they get enough of this and we make sure they get at least 400 micrograms or 0, 0 0.4 milligrams per day of folic acid. And it does. It's, it, it, it has been researched out that it does prevent open neural tube defects such as spina bifida and hydrocephalus. Now, your genetic anemias are a little different. You have a sickle cell and your know, pregnancy is stressful enough. And if they have sickle cell disease, then they go into crisis much easier. And yes, it does happen. Pregnancy can cause a sickle cell crisis. And you know about sickle cell is an abnormal, um, it's an autosomal recessive disorder. And then it's abnormal hemoglobin. So instead of having a nice, beautiful concave, you know, red blood cell, it's more like it has a shape of a like crescent. 
and you know and, or a boomerang sort of thing and so um they then they don't they're not able to what circulate like those beautiful rounded rbcs can go and they can flow smoothly no they they basically get kind of lodged they can get clumped okay and then they just clog up some of the small blood vessels and she has a crisis so um what you have to be very careful because again, the fetus is not going to get the blood supply that it needs from the placenta. Now, thalassemia, um, again, it's a genetic trait and it causes um, an abnormality. Um, one or two chains, uh, chains of the hemoglobin, okay? So that's pretty important, okay? And so we do see this happening in the United States and they can inherit an abnormal gene from each parent and which causes them to have a beta thal uh, thalassemia major, okay? But if only one abnormal gene is inherited, then the infant will have beta thalassemia minor. And that's the better one. Okay, because um, it doesn't seem to affect the fetus so much, and they have mild. Mom has more mild symptoms um, than if they had the major. So, when you know it's that's like I said in in like the first week, you know, know who you're marrying or who your partner is going to be in life, because um, genetics has a lot to play in with how your um, offspring is going to be. So you want to make sure that, you know, if you have thalassemia, that you don't marry somebody else who has thalassemia. Okay. Um, and, and, and these kind of patients, an iron supplement can cause what we call an iron overload, which is not good. So you have to be very careful. But I've had patients that had uh, thalassemia uh, minor and had everybody did good. Mom did good. And baby did good. Yes, we did NSTs on these babies to make sure that a baby was doing fine during pregnancy. And mom was good too. Mom followed a good diet. And so it all worked out. All right. So how are you going to take care of these uh, patients that have these anemias during pregnancy? You know, they're going to be needing more care. They're going to be very fatigued. They've got to be um, encouraged to take their iron supplements and their folic acid. Um, make sure that they know not to take iron supplements with milk. Know that don't take antacids like Tums with um, when you're taking iron. Uh, make sure I know my stools are going to turn colors from dark green to black. Um, and then make sure that they come in uh, for their for their prenatal care. Make sure that they keep hydrated very much so, especially when they may be out in the heat or they're doing activities that um, make sure that they need more water. So that's really important that um, they have a good amount of water, eight to 10 glasses a day even. And then avoid situations which would expose them to infections. So you don't want them to get infection on top of everything else. And then report any signs that they uh, don't feel well. You have to jump on there a little quicker. Okay, so now I'm gonna head into uh, what we call TORCH. These are infections, okay. And we use the acronym TORCH, T-O-R-C-H. And you can write that down. T-O-R-C-H. And next to T, it would be tox toxoplasmosis. Under O would be all the others. So just put others. Under R be um, rubella. Under the C will be the um, cytomegalovirus or CMV. And then you got um, H is for herpes. And so we're going to discuss each one of these briefly. And so remember, these are viral infections. That means there's no effective therapy for a virus. It has to work itself out of the body. And so by taking some um, immunizations can prevent some of these um, infections. So CMV is the cause of congenital infections in newborns. 
So that means the infant could have intellectual disabilities, seizures, um, blindness, deafness, dental abnormalities, and petechiae. Treatment, there's guys, there's no effective treatment known. All right, so this is the um, time that if you have a mom um, CMB positive, that they may have a therapeutic abortion. Okay, and if the CM is discovered early in pregnancy, um, the rubella is another one. Your mom has a low grade fever and a rash. Um, it is very destructive to a developing fetus. So we have to be careful because we do, if mom comes in on her first visit and she doesn't know if she's had a rubella, maybe, you know, her, her mother didn't keep good records or she, you know, just forgot, then we can do a titer. If the titer is low, then we cannot, now hear me out very well, we cannot give an immunization of rubella to a pregnant woman. So we have to wait till after she delivers. And after she delivers, then we can give her the um, immunization before she goes home. Okay. Now, if she comes into us and she's not pregnant, NOT, not pregnant, then we can offer the rubella to her explain what could happen to the fetus if she if she came down with rubella so she gets rubella immunization okay you get a consent form and we give it to her now she has to wait one month before getting pregnant very 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 important okay and so that's where education um you would have to explain to her the reasons why we don't want her to get pregnant during that time all right so um effects on the fetus with a growing embryo um it could be um, a small head uh, very much so we call them um microcephalus um intellectual disability congenital cataracts um deafness cardi cardiac effects can hurt the, their um, hearts and intrauterine growth restrictions. Those are destructive to the developing fetus. So rubella. Rubella is a big one and you'll probably see that again. All right, herpes. Herpes, there's two types of herpes. You have a type one that's likely to cause fever, blisters, or cold sores. And type two is likely to cause genital herpes. Okay, so after your primary infection, this herpes can lie dormant in the nerves in your spinal column, especially, and they can reactivate at any time. So like stress can reactivate herpes. So you get pregnant. Remember, we said pregnancy is a stressful time. I've seen where a woman had, had herpes outbreak. It is painful, by the way. These um, um, blisters are very painful, okay? And so um, you have to be very careful. And if she has an um, active lesion, she cannot deliver vaginal, okay? So then we would deliver her by cesarean. So neonatal herpes can be, you know, localized, it can be widespread, and it attributes to high mortality rate. What's your treatment? Your treatment is always, always, always avoid contact with your with the lesions. Uh, mother and infant, they don't need to be isolated as long as direct contact with lesions is avoided. That means nurse has to explain. Do not touch your lesions and then touch your baby. They have to make sure that they wash their hands very, very, very well. And um, breastfeeding is possible as long as there are no lesions present on the breast. But again, you have to be very, very careful with these herpes lesions. 
Now, hepatitis B is also another one that's out there. It's transmitted by blood, saliva, vaginal secretion, semen, and breast milk. It can also cross the placenta. So the fetus may be infected transplacental, I mean, go, goes across the placenta, or by contact with blood or vaginal secretions during delivery. So upon delivery, the neonate should receive a single dose of hepatitis B immune globulin, and then they can be followed by the hepatitis B vaccine. And we'll talk about this more when we get into newborn and where we give that injection. But it is another worrisome. So what are your risks for hepatitis B? Well, if you're a drug user, um, if you have multiple sexual partners, again, her type of lifestyle the mom has, um, if she has repeated infections with STIs, um, she could have maybe be a nurse and be exposed to blood products and needle sticks, okay? Um, hemodial uh, hemodialysis, another one, of course, I've been risk for hepatitis B, uh, multiple blood transfusions or even other blood products, and then household contact with somebody who's a hepatitis, hepatitis, hepatitis car carrier or um, a dialysis patient. And then, you know, if you get people, you have contact with people coming from other countries where there is a higher incidence of this disease that can put you at risk. All righty. So let's go on and talk about some sexually transmitted infections. All right. Um, just like it says, it's sec it happens during sexual intercourse. And infections that can be transmitted is your syphilis, is the gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas, and um, genital warts. All right. So vaginal changes occur during pregnancy and increases the risk of transmission. And that's why we do blood work in the beginning. We do that RPR and the VDRL to determine if she has any syphilis. Now, the gonorrhea, we do cultures, and we can do for chlamydia. And the, the condylomas, or warts that I said, genital warts, that you can see the warts, and a lot of times a woman gets them um, on her peritoneum, and um, they're like, they are like, they look like little warts. Okay, and sometimes they can do what we call cryotherapy on those warts. But again, you don't want a baby coming through that. You want to get them a mom on antibiotics if she's got syphilis or gonorrhea. And um, take care of the chlamydia and trichomonas also by antibiotics. And so we got to clean this up. Okay, now we got the HIV. And, um, you know, that's the virus that causes AIDS. And it does cripple the immune system. All righty. There is no known immunization or, cure, or really big treatment. They have the new pills out that keeps the um, levels pretty low. But um, there's no cure. Now, babies can get this transplacenta. It goes right, right from mom to baby through the placenta. And... Um, and they're born vaginally, they could, um, the babies can get in contact with the infection uh, through the mom's secretions at birth. And also it goes through, through the um, breast milk. So this type of mom cannot breastfeed, cannot. And you may want to write that down. Okay. So we're gonna what we're gonna do? What's your nursing care we're gonna be, nurses? Well, we're gonna educate the HIV positive woman on met methods to reduce the risk of transmission to her developing fetus. Oh yeah, and um, remember, uh, moms who are HIV positive are more susceptible to an infection, and just like I said, they can they cannot 
as M. And I put that highlighted on this slide for you because it's absolutely contraindicated for moms who are HIV positive. So let's talk about a little bit about torch on um, this toxoplasmosis. Okay. So you've got a parasite. Um, these are non-viral infections, by the way, they're going to talk about. So we've got a parasite that's, and, um, is, it comes in contact with cat feces or raw meat. So your pregnant woman cannot handle cat feces. And she cannot eat raw meat, by the way. <laughs> these are transmitted through the placenta. So they cause pretty bad um, problems to the fetus. The baby is born with a low birth weight, um, may have an enlarged liver and enlarged spleen. Um, baby has jaundice. This would be more pathological jaundice, which is much more severe than physiological jaundice. Um, anemic. Inflammation of the eye structure itself and some neurological damage. So it could affect the brain. And baby's nerves. Not good. So what's your treatment? Well, if you know it um, early enough, you have a therapeutic abortion. That's how serious this is. So what are you going to do? We've got to prevent it. So that first visit that you, you have that lady and you're talking to her and you're doing your interview process, um, you're going to ask her, do you have pets in your home? And she said, yeah. So we said, what kind of pets? Oh, I have cats. I have a cat or a cat or cats. And I said, how many cats do you have? And I said, and who empties the litter box? Well, I do. My husband does. He doesn't like to touch that. Okay. All right. Well, guess what? Husband's going to touch that during the pregnancy because mom can get very easily, <laughs> excuse me, that parasite. And we know what it does to a fetus. Okay. So mom's going to avoid that. She's going to avoid uncooked meat. And she's going to avoid uncooked eggs and unpasteurized milk. Okay. And she's going to wash her fresh fruits very well and her vegetables very well. And, um, and she needs to abide by this. This is pretty serious. And I also, again, as a nurse, you're educating your patients on this. Now, we have another infection. It's called the group beta strep GBS. Now, it does cause a lot of problems to the fetus. And so where this is found is in the woman's rectum, the vagina, the cervix. And it's also found in the throat or your skin. But what we're concerned about is the rectum, the vagina, the cervix, because we don't want a baby coming through that area where in the vagina and the cervix where they can pick up this GBS. So we test every woman during pregnancy around 36 weeks for GBS. Usually about 36, 37 weeks, depending upon her gravity, how many, how many pregnancies she's had. And we want to make sure that if she is GBS positive, that we give antibiotics during labor. Okay. And we'll give the whole time during labor. And then this baby will be watched um, in the NICU for the first 24 hours. Now, this GBS can be deadly to the infant. And babies have a hard enough time breathing on his own after delivery. And these babies kept this GBS in their lungs. And therefore it can cause them to have highland membrane disease or respiratory distress. And it's never good. So we want to make sure that we do these cultures on every patient. Now, years ago, we didn't do these cultures on every patient, and we had babies born with high limb membrane disease, and they were very sick, and some of them didn't make it. So that's why, through a lot of research, we got this GBS 
down packed and we have really made a change. I was part of that research many years ago. I did this for my thesis. All righty. We're going to talk about tuberculosis. Now, TB is a multi-drug resistant strain and is increasing. Um, mothers can be tested, PPD, you know, skin tests. Um, if she's positive, a little chest x-ray and possibly with sputum may be needed. Um, we have to report these kind of infections to the public health department. Um, and uh, if mommy is active, the infant must be kept away from the mother until she's actually cleared by the public health department. So it's pretty, it's pretty serious. Okay. And then we're going to talk about another infection that we talked about several already of uh, this is urinary tract infection. Well, a lot of times the growing uterus um, puts a lot of pressure on the urinary structures. Because you know from the anatomy of the woman's body where the bladder lies. And so it can, it does, it, it puts so much pressure that maybe she doesn't empty completely. So retained urine can become very alkaline and, and can grow bacteria. And so she may develop what we call cystitis and um, it's burning with urination, um, increased frequency and urgency of urination, normal or slightly elevated temperature. It's painful, and it can throw a woman into preterm labor, by the way. Now, if it's not treated, it bacteria goes higher. It can go into your kidneys, and you develop polynephritis. You have a high fever now. Now she's really sick. Um, she's got chills. She's got flank pain or tenderness around the flank area, and she can have nausea and vomiting. Get very sick. Now, this kind of mommy, can this also can put her into preterm labor. Okay, so now we're going to go into some um, lesson 5.3 objectives, and we're almost finished with this chapter. All right, so we're going to talk about environmental hazards. Remember, we, we said something about that in the very beginning that can adversely affect the outcome of pregnancy. And then I'll describe how pregnancy affects the care of the trauma victim. And then Talk about some psychosocial nursing interventions. Okay. All right. So some environmental hazards during pregnancy. You know, um, we got three basic categories for bioterrorism in the pregnant woman. So, you know, you got A, B, and C. Now, A means it can be easily transmitted from person to person that environmental hazard. And B can be spread by food and water. And then C can be spread by a manufactured weapon designed to spread disease. Pretty scary stuff. Now, substance abuse is another environmental hazard that affects pregnancy. And so we have to question, um, it should be focused mainly on the information that will help us and nurses and physicians to provide the safest and most appropriate care to the pregnant woman, her infant. Not always easy, no, but we need to because we need to give mom help and to give the baby help. Okay. And then alcohol. You know, a single episode of consuming two alcoholic dr drinks can lead to the loss of some of the fetal brain cells. Now, that's a pretty good thing to remember because if you're talking to a patient and you're and she and you ask her remember in that first visit we asked them if they um drink and they usually say oh no just maybe social well what is social the social can be different maybe from what my perspective or her perspective so i'll say well how many drinks per day do you drink and then she may say well maybe two and so what am I going to tell, explain to her? Well, now that you're pregnant, we need to really cut that out, right? Okay, because, and let me tell you why I, I'm going to tell you to kind of 
discontinue that for a while is because just two drinks, two alcoholic drinks can lead to a loss of some of your baby's brain cells. Now, I think if somebody said that to me, I would say, okay, I got it. I will not drink anymore. Okay. And sometimes, and you know, it's also when you're talking to patients, is how you talk to them, what tone you're using, and show that you really do care, and you really care about her and the, and her and, and her baby. Okay, and so you have to be very careful when you're when you're when you're suggesting things that they need to discontinue, because all these things are um, they're sort of addicted, you know. We have pe uh, people who are alcoholics, you have smokers, and you have drug users. And they usually um, have, have a form of an addiction to, to these substances. Okay, let's go into trauma during pregnancy. And there's three leading causes of traumatic death. Um, could be an automobile accident, unfortunately. Um, homicide or a suicide. Not good. Um, and then there could be battering. Um, you have your bruises in the various stages of healing. And it's our point as a nurse that we need to go over things. Yeah, we need to go over things with them. Um, make sure that they're not. And, you know, I, I I worked in Florida where in July I had a patient that came in with a turtleneck and a big long sleeves. And I know she had to be hot. But she did that. And I recognized that it was kind of a flu that I needed to gain her trust and to start asking some questions that were not comfortable for anyone but she did um open up that she was abused okay and so you have to handle these very carefully but you know i have the reason why you have to talk about these things is because um if she gets punched in the stomach it causes that placenta to abrupt you know these are there are complications in pregnancy that are, are, are pretty bad okay and we want to we want to take care of her so that her and her baby are safe so if a woman confides in the nurse that she's being abused during pregnancy this information has to be kept and i mean absolutely confidential because you know she's afraid too that her life could be in danger if she if if who if her abuser learns that she's told someone yeah. And only, you know, we can make, you know, referrals to local shelters, but the ultimate decision is up to her and, and her alone. And so it, it puts us in a bad spot because we want to help her so badly, but you can give the information so that she knows where to go if she needs to go. Alrighty, so we talked a lot about complications during this chapter, and I tell you, these complications, preeclampsia, um, anemias, uh, diabetes, um, infections, can affect, the, they can affect the pregnancy and make, make the woman into more what we call a high-risk pregnancy. And this also affects the family. And so you have maybe a disruption of the usual roles in that family. Okay. Maybe that woman is the, um, is the woman who makes, you know, makes more, makes majority of the money that comes into the household. And, um, now she has developed preeclampsia and she's not able to work. Okay. Yeah. It makes them have financial difficulties. Absolutely. And sometimes too, like preeclampsia, the woman is so sick after delivery that um, she's not able to bond with the, with the baby. So there could be a delay, what we call delay attachment to the infant. That's also very hurtful for both, you know, and, um, and sometimes too, there's the loss of experience um, 
of the uh, expected birth experience. Yeah. Like if she was planning and she had a birth plan and she had all planned out what she wanted, and then maybe her cervix didn't dilate like it should have, and she ended up with a cesarean delivery. They get very depressed and they can go into postpartum depression because they didn't have the birth experience that they thought that they wanted. They, they thought they could achieve. They, sometimes women feel like they're a failure. And so I always tell my patients in the very beginning, there's two ways to have a baby. We're going to be, we're going to be in labor and we're going to um, go for a vaginal delivery. Bingo. Now, if something occurs, if the baby doesn't tolerate labor very well, um, we may end up with a C-section. Or your cervix doesn't dilate, we may end up with a C-section. But that's okay. We're just going to have a healthy baby and a healthy mom at the end. And that's what we're going to focus on. And that's what I try to I do a visual with them and try to get them to see healthy baby at the end with a healthy mom. Okay. So um, it, it, it's it's um, a challenge. Now, um, your last part of in your book um, has about the interventions for the grieving process. So having a stillborn um, is very, very dramatic. It's awful. Okay. And so we always allow the parents to remain together in privacy. Give them their privacy um let them grieve if they want to holler and scream and they want to cry 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 allow them we're not here to stop that um we want to always support the family that's what our role is um we want to offer a memento um like a footprint we do a, a memory box at the hospital and we use the white rose on top of the box and um, it's pretty, you know, and um, we put in there like um, the baby's, uh, it had the baby's um, name and have a little card, you know, it's a girl, it's a boy, you know, because it was and um, or is. And then we maybe a little lock of hair if the mother wants that. It and whatever she wants, if she wants their the name the bracelet, um, we'll we'll fill out the bracelet and put the, the baby's bracelet in there. And sometimes we mount it and we put the baby's footprints on the same sheet. It's very nice. And mom wants the handprints. We'll do handprints. Um, we also will take pictures and make sure that the baby um is. If my baby has an anomaly, maybe it has something happened to the head, you want to cover that up with a little cap and take take the picture from the good side. And a lot of times you may have to prepare the parents for the baby, you know. It's not going to look like a normal baby. And so you want to prepare them. Ask them, too. Ask them if they want to hold the baby after the baby's born. Now, some may say no, and that's okay. Um, some may say yes, and that's you give the baby to them. If they say no, baby will be banded, uh, bracelet will be put on, and we'll prepare the body and take the body down to the morgue. Now, sometimes what happens a lot is mom will deliver, say, maybe about, oh, maybe 6 p.m., and then um, we'll take the baby down to the morgue, and then um, mom says about maybe 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, I'd like, nurse, I would, I changed my mind. I'd like to see my baby now. So then the nurse would go down to the morgue with security and we get the baby out of um, the morgue. You always put the baby on a warmer first to warm the baby up. This is, it's terrible to hold a cold baby. We always provide um, parents with educational materials and um, referrals to support groups. Absolutely. And if they have any religious or cultural beliefs, you know, whatever they want to do, it's okay. Okay. And um, you're very, you, you're there to support them the whole time. Okay. So on that, I think now we have come to the end um, of our discussion today on chapter five. So let me um, stop sharing and um, 
thank you all very much and um, keep studying. Bye-bye now.